Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Fire Engineering and Design. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar has been hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Hempel. As a world leading supplier of trusted coating solutions, Hempel is a global company with strong values working with customers in the decorative, marine, infrastructure and energy industries. Hempel factories, R&D centres and stock points are established in every region. Hempel's paints and coatings protect and beautify buildings, infrastructure and other assets and play an essential role in their customers' businesses. They help minimise maintenance costs, improve aesthetics and increase energy efficiency. At Hempel, their purpose is to shape a brighter future with sustainable coating solutions. The company was founded in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1915. It is proudly owned by the Hempel Foundation, which ensures a solid economic base for the Hempel Group and supports cultural, social, humanitarian and scientific purposes around the world. Today, we will hear from two speakers followed by a live audience Q&A and I encourage you all to send through questions via the YouTube chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker for today, Blair Stratton. Blair is a chartered fire safety engineer. He has over 17 years experience in performance-based design of buildings and infrastructure. Blair is one of the founding partners of Red Fire Engineers, responsible for major projects at Red. Blair has particular expertise in heat transfer and fire spread, as well as fire risk assessment. In this talk, Blair will be providing an overview of structural fire resistance, including practical ways of fire protecting steel. Blair will also outline case studies where unique approaches have been used on rail and retail projects to rationalise structural fire protection. Please welcome Blair Stratton. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so today I'm going to be providing a fire safety engineer's perspective on structural fire safety design. Um, just a, by way of background, um, my first degree was in chemical and process engineering and I have a master's in fire safety engineering. Um, that means in terms of structural design, I know enough to be dangerous. I'm certainly not an expert on that side of things. So what I'm going to bring today is more the, um, the building code compliance point of view and how a fire engineer can work with a structural engineer to uh, rationalise or, or to make um, projects go ahead and meet all the uh, objectives that the various design team members have. So I'll be talking about objectives for good structural fire safety design, a um, bit of terminology before we get into the building code of Australia and um, a couple of case studies after we talk about how we might go about doing a fire safety performance solution. The figure on the right is uh, a textbook that really has guided my journey into this space, Structural Design for, uh, for Fire Safety. Um, Andy Buchanan was actually uh, one of my lecturers uh, way back in, in the early 2000s, um, a wealth of knowledge. So when we look at fire safety design in general, we have these three main objectives in our mind. And, and sure, there are other objectives that might be relevant, but these are the three that the building code really wants us to focus on. So we know the fire can happen. We know a little bit about where it could happen and the likelihood of that. But what we want to do is make sure that fire doesn't harm occupants before they've been able to evacuate. Similarly, we know that firefighters need to get into the building to do things like search and rescue, uh, put out the fire and start to protect the environment. Um, the fire shouldn't harm firefighters. We also want to avoid fire spreading to your neighbours. Um, it's partially a property protection issue. You know, your neighbours done nothing wrong. Why should their building burn down if you have a fire in your building? 
but it's also or primarily about evacuating occupants or making sure that you don't need to evacuate occupants in a neighbouring building. Also making sure we don't have a Tower of London, uh, sorry, a Fire of London scenario where we burn an entire city down. Now, when we look at structural design for fire safety, I can modify those clauses ever so slightly. And, and really we have the same objectives. We don't want structural failure due to fire to harm occupants before they've evacuated, or you know, we don't want structural failure at all in many cases. Uh, failure shouldn't pancake or, or um, uh, cause things to hit or damage firefighters. Things shouldn't fall off the outside of buildings like cladding. We also don't want to harm our neighbour in terms of uh, having our structure fall over the boundary onto the, on, onto the neighbour's property. And um, importantly, we don't want that to bring with it fire spread. But, um, so again, this is all about occupant life safety, protecting your neighbour, protecting our firefighters. There are also other objectives we might look at to take things a little bit further. Our friends in the architectural community certainly have their ideas about what looks good and we should really take notice of that because engineers are how do we make it happen. So we want to support that flexibility for architects. We want to come up with cost effective ways of minimising the use of the earth's resources and sometimes that means looking at a problem in a way that uh, might not be you know, totally prescriptive, but can we justify the performance of a structure uh, in a different way and, and come up with a better, uh, more cost-effective uh, design? And maintenance and service life is really about, if we have a solution that requires us to come back every five years and, and rebuild the, the structure because we had a, had a fire and the structure, you know, just didn't, didn't hold up, or because we have to reapply the protection because we put the wrong thing in a car park and it keeps on getting damaged by the movement of vehicles. We need to consider what's the longevity of, of the system. And finally, I've put up property protection because the building code does actually allow us to have uh, fire spread. It allows us to have uh, fire causing collapse provided that those other objectives I talked about, occupant safety, firefighter safety, and neighbor safety are met. But after a fire in a building that we design, you could be left with a pile of ashes. Now, insurers and owners, um, owners corporations, they might care about going a little bit further so that they actually have minimal reinstatement after a fire, minimal downtime, improved business continuity. So when we look at the building code, it gives us a lot of things called fire resistance levels. Now here I'm, I'm solely talking about the deemed to satisfy provisions and we'll get to the, the distinction between a DTS solution and performance solution shortly. But here in, in the deemed to satisfy provisions, we see this terminology fire resistance levels uh, peppered throughout the building code. Now primarily that's in specification C 1.1 of the code. And that tells us for different types of construction, type A, B and C, and different classes of building from class two to nine, that's your residential buildings right through to your hospitals and assembly buildings, movie theatres, etc., and everything in between, like labs, um, warehouses, car parks, etc. So for, for those combinations of type of construction and classification, we'll be given three numbers that we need to achieve. So the first number, structural adequacy, then integrity and insulation. And so hopefully this um, so, so structural adequacy is the focus of this talk, obviously, and should be fairly, at, uh, fairly obvious. We want to um, design structures to uh, comply with the building code and avoid collapse for as long as necessary. Uh, integrity, um, the, the toe poking through the sock, what we want to have is barriers that withstand fire spreading from one side of the barrier to another. And finally, insulation. We want to make sure that fire doesn't spread because it heats up a surface on one side and spreads uh, heat by conduction through that object like a wall or a floor to the other side of the, of the, um, of the object. So Kylie Jenner is uh, obviously pretty well insulated there. So non-load bearing elements don't have the first two X's in the, in the three FRL uh, um, nomenclature. So I'd have a dash 120, 120 fire resistance level for a two hour non-load bearing wall. Uh, 
Now, I, I can say two hours because I've already explained it's a dash 120, 120 FRL. But if you hear someone talk about two hours in a design meeting, pull them up about it and say, well, are you talking about integrity or insulation? Because those numbers don't necessarily need to be the same. Um, similarly, load bearing elements like columns and beams typically don't do anything to stop a fire spreading through an element, um, either by uh, flame going through gaps in the element or, or insulation failure because they're, they're actually not a wall, they're not a floor, they're not a barrier system, they are a structural support system. But other structures such as uh, load bearing uh, walls and floors might need all three of these numbers. It's important to note that a fire resistance level is not the time to failure under, sorry, it, it is the time to failure under standard test conditions. It is not a real time to failure. Uh, to stretch an example, a fire door that has a dash 60 30 fire resistance level might last for 15 minutes before it fails due to insulation under a really intense, really fast and hot burning fire like a hydrocarbon fire on an oil rig. Um, conversely, if there's never a fire in the building, the fire door will last until you pull it out of the, out of the, the, the building. So we have a fire resistance level somewhere between 15 minutes of real time and infinite time depending on where the fire starts. It might never fail in an actual fire. So a fire resistance level is not a real time to failure. So we can't pick up a solution off the shelf and say, right, this is a two hour uh, firewall, therefore it'll last two hours. We just can't do that. It's the wrong use of that terminology. Um, explain this a bit further. How do we determine fire resistance levels? Uh, we can do it analytically, but the fun way to do it is to put a wall or a or a floor or a beam and load it up in, into a test furnace and heat that furnace really quickly uh, in accordance with the standard time temperature curve. So here you can see a European test furnace, but all these fire tests are generally done on the same curve. Um, and the, the wall on the left that's just being pulled away from the furnace, that's the element that was uh, being tested. Um, and you can see it's all blackened and glowing, but on the other side for that to have passed the fire resistance test, you shouldn't have got over 180 Kelvin temperature rise on the average of several thermocouples. You shouldn't see any flames penetrating the barrier. So this is how we determine um, our, our standard fire resistance levels. So every product, every system, every combination of systems like intermessing coatings on uh, structural steel work, that will um, have some way of determining what the FRL ascribed to this element is. And I mentioned the standard temperature curve, so that furnace will be heated up generally to the ISO 834 curve, which is illustrated here. That, that curve is used um, throughout Europe, uh, the UK and Australia and New Zealand, um, most of the world in fact. The uh, North Americans have an ASTM curve, which is very similar um, mathematically and, and, and in practice, but of course they have, have different standards. We have different standards around the world. Um, now, it's really important to note that that fire probably has very little to do with the fire in a real building. So in an enclosure, like a room, you know, a, a cupboard or a, um, an office or an apartment or a warehouse, we generally follow these steps. We start to get smouldering um, when something overheats or a welding torch is left um, unattended. Um, and, and eventually we'll get to the ignition point where we start to see flaming. Um, at some point the fire starts to grow and gets big enough that we, we're starting to get interaction between the fire and its surroundings. And then we get interaction between the surroundings and the fire, so we get feedback from the smoke layer down to objects that haven't yet burnt. Um, in the right conditions we can transition to what's called flashover, and then we get a fully developed fire where effectively the entire compartment is a well-mixed reactor full of hot gas and, um, and very toxic um, environment. So it generally at the point of flashover, people are no longer uh, alive in, inside the compartment, um, which is why we need, um, in many cases, detection sprinklers and things to act well in the early stages of the, um, uh, of the fire. So that fire I'm looking at there is very different than the time temperature curve here, which is uh, continuously growing, um, providing more, more impact on the structure, but in the early stages is actually not um, very intense. Whereas this fire, 
at flashover, you'll, you'll get a very sudden impact on a structure. And that's important when we're designing things like concrete versus steel, because concrete and steel react to fast growing fires in different ways. So under the Building Code of Australia, we have two uh, main compliance pathways. Well, in fact, they're the only compliance pathways. There are different ways of demonstrating compliance with each, but effectively we can pick an off-the-shelf cookbook approach, the deemed to satisfy solution. So by following the cookbook recipe, you'll get a cake at the end of it um, that is perfectly delicious and nutritious. And uh, if, if you're um, using this uh, recipe analogy, a performance solution is effectively a cook trying to substitute eggs for bananas because you didn't have eggs. Um, we're trying to make a cake in a different way. We're trying to make a building design in a different way than the off the shelf solution. Um, this is a diagram from the building code and, and it demonstrates there is equivalence between performance solutions and deemed to satisfy solutions. So if someone says, oh, you know, that fire engineer, they pulled far too much out of the deemed to satisfy provisions, it's an unsafe design. Well, maybe the deemed to satisfy provisions were uh, overly conservative. Similarly, some deemed to satisfy solutions, if you analyse them, might not actually meet the performance requirements but they are deemed to satisfy. So we don't actually have to worry about that case from a legal standpoint. If you comply with the DTS, you're safe, you meet the performance requirements. However, you might not have met your architectural um, objectives. So we're coming with a performance solution to try and um, make our clients happy, make the architects happy. Um, and we wanna work with the structural engineers to make the design cost effective and efficient. So I mentioned the classifications. Um, generally, we're dealing with class two to nines as fire safety engineers. I haven't mentioned class one houses or class 10 sheds and carports um, that are dealt with in a different volume of the building code. Um, similarly, you can do a performance solution for those, although it's typic more typical to do deemed to satisfy design. Now, if you want to comply with the deemed to satisfy provisions, you simply go to a manufacturer and say, I need this fire resistance level. You know, it might be a 240, 90, 30 FRL for a wall, um, or, or it might be a dash 60, 30 fire door. Um, and we also have to consider details like penetrations through walls and floors. And we need to make sure the protection method to those is also going to comply. However, if you want to do a performance solution, really it's up to the fire safety engineer to work with the architect, structural engineer and building surveyor or certifier, depending on which state you're in. Um, we, we need to make sure that they, they will come along for the journey, they give us the right inputs so we can do an analysis and demonstrate that a certain amount of protection is needed to achieve the performance requirements. And so in general, we are engaged as fire safety engineers to try and reduce the amount of protection required. And I've got a couple of case studies that we'll get to in a moment that um, illustrate that a bit more um, uh, in a bit more practical way. So a fire safety engineer, look, this is, this is not a course in fire safety engineering. Um, this is uh, quite, quite a lot of um, training to try and upskill uh, chemical engineers like myself to, uh, to, to get to the point where we can do this. Um, so don't, don't underestimate how difficult item one is. Um, you know, th there is limited data out there on all of those issues, fuel loads, uh, ignition sources, and probabilities of, of those uh, of, of fires happening. Uh, a lot of the research that we're relying on today is uh, based on research that was actually carried out in the 70s and 80s. We use a lot more plastic now, electrical systems are a lot more intrinsically safe. Um, so the, the swings are roundabouts. Um, the heat release rate is probably the most important input to a fire safety engineer. It really describes how a fire is burning in time and it gives us information that we can use to uh, investigate the impact of a fire on a structure. The ventilation of a building or a compartment uh, will certainly change how fire grows and develops and interacts with a building and the structure within the building. And fire safety systems such as um, sprinklers, detection systems, even fire extinguishers and hose reels allow a, a certain interaction between the real world and, and our theoretical fire 
So what we need to do is distill all this information into credible design fire scenarios. So we don't want to worry about the sun turning supernova. That's not credible. It's not something you can design, design for. Uh, it's not something the building code cares about. But there are design fire scenarios that we can care about, like a washing machine fire or, or a dryer or, or a kitchen fire. Um, we can look at um, you know, cash registers at the till of the bar. That might be the source of a fire, but that fire might spread to the bar stools or the furniture in the bar. Um, and we can start to build up a model of how the heat release rate will change with time and the impact of that fire on the structure. We pull all this together, we put it into a performance-based design brief, which we used to call a fire engineering brief, but now you need to do a PBDB for uh, any departure from the building code, not just fire safety, but um, you know, structure and energy efficiency as well, we need to write a brief. Um, and in that brief is what we call a trial concept design. This is our best guess before we've presented the analysis to the stakeholders of what the outcomes are likely to be. So we can tell our architects straight away, we don't think we're going to be, be able to justify this structure having a reduced fire resistance level. So you need to go and find a wall system or a structural support system that is going to meet these fire resistance level requirements. Or we can say, well, look, we've had a chat to the structural engineer. They've told us that they've over-designed the structure um, for fire because they need a really high resistance to wind impacts or earthquake uh, impacts. And therefore, there's a lot of redundancy in the structure. And we might be able to use that to say, well, look, our, our, our first guess is that we might be able to reduce or maybe even eliminate the fire resistance level to that structure. We might be able to avoid the need for protection to some or all of the structure. So that PBDB gets sent to stakeholders such as Fire Rescue Victoria or, or the Fire Brigade in your state or territory, um, and as well as the building surveyor architect, et cetera. And they make sure that it, it meets their objectives. What we're going to analyze isn't so far off in left field, maybe people want a peer review. So th these are the times to, to raise these sorts of questions when the, the PBDB is first issued. It's no good allowing us to write the analysis, write the fire engineering report and say, Oh, couldn't you have looked at a, a hotter fire? Or, um, yeah, I'm not sure about those inputs. Can you redo the analysis? Because many hours of, um, of, of time and uh, many weeks of the project have, have gone and, and it might be too late to then start the trial concept design again. Um, assuming our acceptance criteria have met, you know, structure didn't, uh, didn't fail before occupants have got out of the building, uh, including a safety factor. Um, then the fire engineer will then document the analysis and confirm, basically turn the trial concept design into fire engineering outcomes. So we're now telling people, this is what we think the building needs. And once a building surveyor or certified does all their checks and, and issues a permit, our, our report effectively replaces parts of the building code um, with this performance solution. So instead of them to satisfy, you can now rely on the fire engineering report and this tells you what you need to do. So how do we get there? Um, in, a, in a fire engineering sense, we have um, six, six themes we need to think about. The type of approach could be absolute, which means we are comparing to a benchmark that we're proposing for the first time. There's no such thing as zero risk, but we might be able to classify an acceptable level of risk based on um, you know, societal or, or FN curves uh, for, for um, societal risk or individual risk curves. Or we might be looking at um, the the time to get out of the building should exceed the time before conditions become untenable or, be, or before collapse occurs and, and include a safety factor. So that's an absolute approach. A comparative approach means that we just need to be a little bit better than the deemed to satisfy provisions. In fact, we could have exactly the same level of safety as the DTS provisions, and that would be acceptable as well. On the second line, we can qualitatively talk about why we think our design is better, or we can quantitatively show it with a model or calculations. And we can do a single set of calculations based on some fixed inputs, or we can run a probabilistic analysis. Um, the latter is quite difficult if you don't have good data. So to illustrate how this might work in practice, um, a comparative approach could quite often just be qualitative. Um, in some, some cases, there's no way of quantifying things, like, um, for instance, the performance of materials or uh, in, in linings of a, of a building or the direction of door swings. You know, that, that's more of a qualitative analysis. So 
Another one we might do, we could do an absolute qualitative deterministic analysis. So that's a little bit dangerous. It sounds like expert judgment. There's fire engineers basically saying, trust me, I'm pretty sure this is safe, but I'm not gonna look at any variables outside my, my standard inputs. Um, and a really unusual approach would be to use event trees um, and, and to actually quantify the probability of something going wrong. So a couple of case studies which have used uh, different, different approaches. The first one uh, is a rail station that's currently under design in Victoria. And due to the escalation of material costs over the last year, um, the structure was initially designed to be fully protected to achieve the prescribed uh, 120 dash dash fire resistance level. Now, the design of this particular stair uh, shaft is quite unusual in that due to spatial constraints around the, the ground of the structure, the walls are actually suspended from the roof, which in turn is supported from the lift structure. So when we're understanding the building code, it says uh, if, if I'm telling you to fire at the external wall, then everything that takes the load of that external wall down to ground also needs to be fire rated. So in a large open structure like a, a lift core with a stair wrapping around it with the external walls that are close to the boundary, and we want to avoid those walls falling over the, our neighbour, um, that means that the lift shaft, the, the roof and the columns supporting the wall all needed to be fire rated. Um, and, and because of escalation, the cost of providing an intermessent coating system to all four sides of every column beam brace within that uh, was substantial. We're talking seven figures for a single stair. So the design team came to us and said, well, look, can we look at this rationally? We said, okay, well, what, what is this fire resistance level needed for? I mean, it's around a stair, it's around a lift, but it's not the only stair in the building. And the building code isn't imposing this requirement for a 120 dash dash fire resistance level on us uh, because of a, a, an egress issue. We have redundancy. The fire brigade can get to this fire from ground from several directions or they can uh, get to the platform using another stair. So in terms of that objective of the building code, we're actually meeting both the occupant egress and firefighting uh, objectives without even doing any work. What we need to do is make sure that a fire in our building isn't going to lead to structural collapse across the boundary because that could damage our neighbour's property, but more importantly, it could, um, could harm or injure, uh, Ill, injure or kill someone on the, on the neighbour's property. Um, and we also need to make sure that if, a, if the neighbour has a fire, they're actually allowed to have a certain amount of radiation come towards our, our building. We need to be able to withstand that without the fire spreading because, again, we want to make sure that firefighters have enough time and enough resources to do their job. Asking them to fight two fires on different sides of a property boundary uh, might stretch their resources. So we want to avoid that. So this is, illustrates the, um, the design in a little bit, little bit more detail. Um, highlighted in, in colour is the lift shaft. So we've got columns and beams um, with different load ratios. Um, so that's a measure of the utilisation of the column during a fire load case. Now, the structure that, that we've highlighted is a lift shaft, so generally doesn't have a lot of uh, live load in it. During a fire, there should be no live load because people are not using, um, using the fire, uh, sorry, not using the lifts to evacuate. Um, Grayed out are the external walls of the structure and that's, um, you can just see faintly the, the stair um, stringers coming down. So the stairs go in this direction and wrapping around the lift core up to the platform um, at, at the top of the lift. So the lift is only connecting two levels. So the structural engineer was able to tell me as a fire safety engineer, I have a lot of redundancy in my steel work when it comes to designing for occupant, uh, sorry, for designing for fire. So perhaps you can use that as a fire safety engineer. And yes, absolutely we could. So we chose an absolute approach. We effectively said we want to prove from first principles using heat transfer uh, modeling and our understanding of fires on this, on this uh, building that we won't get collapse. Uh, we're going to quantify that. So we, we looked at a range of different design fires and we uh, determined what the temperature would be for each of those design fires on critical parts of the structure. And it was deterministic. We didn't assign a probability to any of these things. We just said, this fire can happen. What are the effects of that? Let's withstand those effects. 
Um, the Although the use is a train station, the first uh, fire that came to mind was actually arson um, because an arsonist with a bit of fuel, we want to make sure that they're not going to be able to start a small fire that actually has a really, really bad response in terms of causing an unprotected column to collapse. Uh, I mentioned we care about our neighbour giving us uh, a lot of heat by radiation. Um, so the building code tells us how much radiation we need to withstand without collapsing and without um, fire spreading. We also did consider a train fire at the platform and a fire within the lift shaft itself. The structural engineer was helpful in that they provided those load ratios. So that allows us to calculate a limiting temperature for each member. Uh, in practice, um, generally the structural engineer will look at um, what, the, what they expect to be the worst case. Um, structural models help, are helpful here, um, but there is quite a lot of detail required to go into to determine load ratios. So, so um, structural engineers and fire engineers, we're, we're different sides of the same coin. We like to be efficient. Um, so looking at the worst case, if we can make that work, then let's not even bother about analysing the rest of them. Um, AS4122 is helpful in that it allows us to calculate the fire resistance level uh, of steelwork that is protected by a slab. Um, and, and in this case, we said, well, if we've got an intermittent coating on, on one or two sides of the member, or in fact, on three sides, then let's just be conservative and say that, that side is protected from the fire and we've only got the exposed sides of the member that can heat up. Um, we, we looked at the design fire side of the research. We modelled and, and used um, some uh, actually quite basic hand calculations to determine temperatures at different parts of the structure. And we also looked at how long the fuel would last. So if you've got a litre of fuel that of petrol, for instance, that an arsonist has splashed around the place, then we can look at how big that fire is and how long it's going to last. Um, we conservatively assumed that how hot that fire gets around the column or at the beam is the same temperature as the steel. Now, in reality, there will be some delays as that heat is transferred through the member, either um, by conduction and, and it could also be uh, emitted by the member as it heats up to the environment that's not exposed to the fire. So if, if you have a, a small fire around the base of a column, the bo bottom of that column is going to heat up, but you will get some transfer through the steel to the, the colder parts of the steel. Uh, we conservatively neglected that for this analysis. We didn't need to do it. And we determined if the limiting temperature was exceeded by any one of these fires. So what we were able to prove is that we didn't need protection to any of the bracing. And that was actually done by the structural engineer without even needing our input. The bracing in this case wasn't critical to restraining the columns during a fire. The lo live load, the wind loads, etc., uh, assumed to be so low during a fire case that the bracing wasn't actually doing any work, so it didn't need protection. Um, the roof structure, because it was at such a high level above what were some fairly small fires, uh, and even the train fire that was you know, several metres away at the platform, even under wind conditions, we didn't get the roof heated up. And most of the beams in the in the design, um, stair beams, etc., uh, did not require protection. The protection that was required was generally to lift columns and beams, um, as, as well as the columns near the boundary did need protection, but not the full 120 dash dash. We only needed 60 dash dash. So we've effectively halved the amount of intermittent coating provided. Um, you know, that's uh, more than half the budget saved because of a fire engineering assessment. And the, uh, the lift columns and beams, because the columns and beams are hard up against uh, one or two sides of the glass, you can't actually protect those with an intermittent coating because there's no room for the coating to expand. And I believe David will talk about the expansion properties of intermittent in his uh, presentation. Um, but what we were able to demonstrate that is, uh, is rather than figuring out a way to have the columns and beams separated from the glass by a 50 or 60 mil air gap to allow the intermittent to, um, to expand, we were able to demonstrate that it was actually okay from a fire perspective to only uh, effectively fire rate the sides of the members that you could see. So that was a good result. The um, second case study uh, was a retail fit out. So for type A construction, we actually need a three hour structural fire rating, 180 dash dash. That's a really hard thing to achieve with an intermessant because you need several coats of 
of intermescent, you need really large members uh, because you're relying on the heat transfer into the member. The steel is actually absorbing a lot of heat uh, without raising temperature. So if you have small members, they're going to heat up really quickly. You need a lot of intermescent in that case. Um, the architect wanted to strip back concrete render that was already on these columns. They didn't want to put something back like vermiculite that, that looked, you know, frankly messy uh, when it's in a retail environment. Um, they didn't want to use board systems because then you'd just have a boring square box. They wanted to look at the eye columns. Uh, working in our favour, the buildings are sprinkler protected. There are fire stations nearby. There was a very limited occupancy. In fact, this part of the building, although it was Taipei construction, which would usually be three or four storeys or more, um, this part of the building was actually only two storeys. So the consequence of collapse was actually going to be less severe. Uh, and because we had sprinklers and other detection systems, we were quite confident that people would be able to evacuate uh, from the upper level. So what, what we needed to know is, well, can we get firefighters there in time to start putting water on the fire? Now, we had limited structural information uh, in, in this case. It was, it was quite unique. So what we did was um, a uh, we, we first of all calculated the equivalent fire severity and we looked at how hot the fire is going to get and how long is it going to last, assuming all the, all the fuel burns and under several ventilation scenarios. And what we found is in all those scenarios, we have a fire that's actually cooler than the standard fire test. So I was like, okay, that's an interesting observation. If we have 60 dash dash fire resistance level protection to the steelwork, then I know that's actually going to last at least 60 minutes in a post flashover fire. So previously I said you couldn't do that. This is the one case you can do that. When you understand the ventilation conditions, if you can prove the temperature of your fire is always going to be lesser than a standard fire, then you can actually start to talk in real times and it's conservative to do so. Uh, that's that's the outside of the uh, of, of the retail shop. I unfortunately don't have an image of the steel work, but you can all imagine a steel eye column. Um, and um, what, what we were doing is, you know, can we use an intermessive coating to justify that uh, uh, with, without going to a three hour fire adding? And this is a really cut down version of the event tree that we, that we modeled. Um, so we worked out the probability of a fire starting. We then randomized where that fire starts on a two dimensional grid. Because what we were able to do is look at research into fire size and growth and probability of fires in retail shops and say, OK, well, assuming a fire has a random chance of starting anywhere on that grid and we know the frequency of fires, we can actually start to say what is the likelihood of a fire starting in any part of the floor. We also had statistics on how fast a fire grows and we assumed it grows radially, which is, I think, a fair assumption. Um, so it grows in a circle over the floor. And at some point, either the sprinklers are going to go off or the firefighters are going to get there or the fire is going to self-extinguish. And in each of those cases, we looked at uh, are, the, are the sprinklers going to work? So we know the likelihood of a sprinkler system uh, working or not working. Sprinklers are really reliable. If you can get them in your project, fire engineers can do a lot with a sprinkler protected building. We had statistics that told us the likelihood of flashover occurring, so that transition to full compartment burning. But I also wanted to know about what about the small fires that don't get to flash over? Is that going to damage a column? And this is where that, that two-dimensional grid came in handy because we said, OK, well, if the fire starts 10 metres away from the column and only grows to uh, a, a one or a two megawatt fire before the sprinklers uh, activate or before the fire brigade get there and start to ignite, uh, start to suppress the fire, we can actually look at, has the fire damaged the columns? We built a crude radiation model to see if that fire was big enough to transfer heat into the column by distance through radiation. Um, and we also looked at how long is this fire going to last? So the, the fuel load was uh, randomised based on some statistical analysis um, and the intensity and duration of the fire. This is all done in a spreadsheet, which um, ran to many, many pages took a lot of time to verify it and we needed to get a peer reviewer to make sure that we were uh, not just doing some crazy fire engineering. Um, the firefighters uh, intervention, well we have a model for that and we know uh, statistically how long they, they take to, uh, to turn up. So in the spreadsheet we were able to run a Monte Carlo analysis, which is a fancy name for dice rolling. 
using all these probability inputs and this inventory model that we've uh, presented, we wanted to know what is the addition of these red numbers. You know, when your sprinklers have, have failed and you go to flash over and the firefighters couldn't get there before that happened to start putting water on. Or where we've got a, a fire that hasn't got to flash over but is going to damage one or more columns and is going to last long enough that could lead to failure and the fire brigade wasn't able to get there in time. And so what we were able to prove using this model is that the likelihood of a fire in this retail tenancy causing a column to collapse when we've got 30 dash dash protection instead of 180 was one in 36 million years. It was a very, very vanishingly small likelihood of failure with just a minimum amount of protection on, this, on these columns. So the architect was thrilled because we were able to uh, demonstrate that we didn't need all that, um, so many coats of intermessing coating. That's uh, all I've got time for. So thank you very much for attending and uh, I hope you enjoyed David's presentation. Thank you, Blair, for your insights. And now I'd like to welcome our second and final speaker, David Barron. David is a chartered engineer with 15 years of experience in the industry, with an emphasis on steel design for both ambient and fire limit states using various global design standards. David now leads a global team responsible for fire engineering and estimation of intumescent coatings for Hempel. Please welcome David Barron. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and thank you for letting me present at um, this event today. Um, so my name is David Barron and I'll be presenting on the topic of prescriptive versus performance-based design and looking really into passive fire protection for structural steel work. Uh, but really we will be drilling down into the topic today of limiting and design temperatures. And the reason I've wanted to present on this topic today is limiting temperatures that we use to limit the steel temperature rise in structures um, are usually based on prescribed values um, within the industry that we adopt without doing any structural kind of calculations. Um, but really, I want to go into a bit more detail about how we can actually calculate those temperatures and the benefits they can bring on projects. Um, so really the contents of the presentation today will look into a little bit, well, a little bit about an introduction to my organization, Hempel, but I want to sort of go into how we calculate thicknesses of passive fire protection, go into a little bit of terminology we use as structural engineers um, on utilization and limit states. And the reason I want to do this is so that we can fully understand where these default limiting temperatures have come from within the industry. But then after that, I also want to show you if we understand that, we can understand how we can actually calculate temperatures based on the applied structural loads in structures. Um, and I'm hoping that. Um, at the end of this presentation, you'll have a, a really good awareness of how we actually calculate thicknesses of passive fire protection. The key differences between limiting and design temperatures for structural steel work. And really understand the rational behind where some of these default limiting temperatures have come from within the industry. As I've mentioned earlier, this is not well understood um, throughout the industry typically. And then finally, I want to go into sort of the benefits of conducting structural fire design assessments. Um, and as these are rarely done, just showing you know, the benefits of doing this and how this can help the built environment. So with that, let's, let's get started. And Pempel might be quite new um, to Australia and particularly Southeast Asia. We, we have been um, on quite a bit of a journey in terms of passive fire protection. Um, and over 10 years ago, we opened up our first test laboratory in Barcelona, Spain. Um, so it's now been a decade since we've been um, making, designing um, products for the passive fire protection industry. Um, and we've been on quite a journey releasing a number of products. But also in 2008, we opened up a state-of-the-art facility in Barcelona um, so that we could create even more products going forwards and support the products we currently have. Um, we've also had a lot of emphasis on the support structure we have for projects. So that includes our people, competencies, and really looking at our estimation and engineering setups within Hempel. Um, 
And then in 2020, we've, we've actually expanded our global reach as well. Um, predominantly, we have been in Europe, Middle East, but now we're in Southeast Asia. And the reason we wanted to have this call with all the engineers today, um, just to sort of introduce ourselves, but also trying to go through some of the key topics, and um, in this case, limiting temperatures and design temperatures with you all today. And I had mentioned that um, we, we have done a lot in terms of the competencies within our organization. This is structural engineers, fire engineers, estimators, um, focused commercial teams, product managers um, that are all trained, very competent in passive fire protection so that we can support you on projects wherever they are globally. Again, I mentioned we'd open up a state-of-the-art facility in Barcelona to actually make more innovative products um, for the market, which we need to do that in collaboration with yourselves. And we make products that are fit for purpose for the industry and the building types we see going forwards. So it's great that we're able to present today and hopefully we'll be working with you all closely going forwards. Um, again, Hempel is a global company, so with a global footprint, over 28 factories, over 7,000 employees, um, and over 15 R&D centers of excellence, we have a lot of a lot of potential to be able to support on projects globally. Also, we're developing our own in-house software to be able to support these calculations also. So, so we've got a lot of things that are going on, a lot of strategic initiatives, um, and it's fair to say that Hempel really want to be a key player in passive fire protection going forwards. Um, so, I think that's enough on sort of introduction to the organization. Um, so why don't we get stuck into the actual topic at hand? And, and to start with, I know there are many presentations that have been carried out as part of this um, series. So I'm gonna to briefly touch on how we calculate thicknesses of passive fire protection. Um, these are only a few slides, as many of you might be very well aware of how we actually calculate these. But why do we need to protect structural steelwork from fire at all? Well. All materials in fire will lose their properties at elevated temperatures. Um, steel is no different. And, and the graph you're seeing in front of you shows the strength reduction um, of steel. And in, in fact, what you're seeing is the yield um, strength reduction um, based on the Euro codes. Um, and as you see on the left axis, you have strength retention. At the top, one, um, so all its strength. And at the bottom, zero, no strength. And on the bottom axis, you have the actual steel temperature. So from zero degrees up to 1,200 degrees. So in normal conditions, strength, steel will have all of its strength and able to support the applied structural loads. However, in the event of a fire, that steel will quickly heat up. And at around 550 degrees, it will have lost 40% of its strength. And as that steel element continues to heat up, it will continue to lose its strength. So at around 630 degrees, it would have lost 60% of its strength. And at around 725, it would only have 20% of its capacity remaining. So at some stage, this steel is no longer going to be able to apply, uh, to be able to support the applied structural loads. So we need to insulate it. Um, and we can do that um, using an intumescent coating. And this is what Hempel um, develop, that, that, that's the product ranges that we have are intumescence. Um, but there's a few key parameters we need to be able to actually calculate the thickness of the intumescent needed to ensure that those buildings maintain their stability. Um, and to do that, we need a few parameters. Um, one of those being the section factor. Um, this is a very well-known term throughout the industry, but it basically relates to the um, how quickly that steel profile will heat up. And it's related to how much of a surface area steel is exposed to fire against how much mass of steel is there. So a slender, light section with a large surface area would heat up quicker than a stocky, chunky section of a low surface area. And it determines how quickly that steel element will heat up, known as the section factor. Next, we need to know the fire duration. So how long does that structure need to maintain its stability? Um, this is given in terms of duration in minutes, um, 60 minutes, 90, 120 are very typical in the um, infrastructure markets or cellulosic fire protection. So we need to know how long the building needs to maintain its stability. And often that is driven by local legislation, looking at occupancy types, height of buildings um, and inventories within them. Um, it varies depending on where you are, but usually quite prescribed values based on the structure type. And finally, we need to know what temperature do we need to limit the steel to? Um, and this is actually gonna be where we're really focusing our discussions today on, on this concept of temperature. But once you know this, you can calculate a dry film thickness of intubescent. And 
how do we actually do that? Well, the work we do in the labs, um, we, we create um, what is known as EMTA tables, um, or MTA tables rather, should I say, multi-temperature assessments. And, and the graph here or the table you're seeing in front of you at the minute has a few parameters. It has the temperature running across the top and section factor running down the left here. So you've got different temperatures at the top and you have different section factors on the, the left column. Um, and we have tables that are for beams that are three-sided with a concrete slab. We have tables for four-sided beams and we have tables for various column elements, hollows, circulars, rectangulars and I section columns and we have these tables for all the different fire durations we've tested and we do these testing uh, these these tests to um, test standards in third-party accredited test laboratories but basically we generate these tables and perhaps we get an inquiry where we know the fire duration is 120 minutes and it's a column profile we will turn to the correct um, table and then what we do is well we then usually pick a temperature, say 550 degrees, a default temperature that we, we can find within the industry that we think will adequately insulate that steel element. And then we can obviously calculate the section factor because that is only based on the steel geometry. And then we get a DFT. In this case, 1,500 microns. Um, now, obviously, that's quite a laborious task to do all those calculations manually. So when I mentioned software earlier, there is software available to actually do these calculations and developing in-house to automate these based on the parameters we've just discussed. But this is the parameters we use and this is how we calculate thicknesses. But that temperature, why do we pick 550? Why, why not 600 or why not 500? Why, why do we pick 550 for columns? And, and basically what we're going to be discussing over the next slides and the real focus of this presentation today is looking at default limiting temperatures and design temperatures. And it's that idea between prescriptive and performance-based design. Um, and, and the way we, we use terminology within Hempel is if we receive an inquiry of just a steel list of a structure, we would default to default limiting temperatures, prescriptive values. And we would call this estimation, typically. So we've got the steel sizes, we can calculate section factors and use these prescribed values for the temperature. But structural fire design is different. Section factor does not change, but we actually calculate the failure temperatures or rather the limiting temperatures or design temperatures based on the applied structural loads. So these are the bits we're going to look into in a little bit more detail on the next slides. And, and to do this, we need to understand um, a little bit of structural engineering terminology. Uh, and the two bits of terminology I'm going to now sh share with you is this concept of utilization and this concept of limit states. Um, which are very important for us to then understand where the default values have come from and then subsequently how we can actually design these temperatures. So it's really important to note that default limiting temperatures used within the industry all have one thing in common. They assume that steel is fully stressed or at 100% utilization for the ultimate limit state. As I say, we'll get onto limit states in a second. But basically, utilization just refers to how much of the structural capacity of that steel element is being used. I have three beams to the left here. Um, so you can imagine that the beam on the left, if that was at 100% utilization, what I'm basically saying is I could apply no more load to that steel element without it being deemed to have failed on whatever criteria we're looking at. But the beams of exactly the same size to the right of it don't have the same amount of load. So they have more capacity left within them. So these would be at lower level of utilization, maybe 100% on the left, 80% in the middle, and maybe 40, 50% at the far right. So this is the concept of utilization. How much of the steel's strength is actually being used? So understanding utilization, what did I mean by limit state? Um, well, limit states, basically as engineers, we check for a number of things to make sure that structures are going to be suitable. We look at things such as serviceability requirements or the SLS, serviceability limit state. We also look at ultimate limit states and sometimes accidental limit states on the far right. But what do these mean? Well, serviceability, we as engineers, we estimate the loads we expect to see in a structure. We then take these unfactored loads and we check for certain criteria such as deflection, cracking and vibration, to name a few. But we check, we check for a few parameters, make sure the steel elements can deal with this. 
What we also do is we then factor those loads up. We, we, we assume there's going to be more load within the building, and then we check that it actually has enough strength to support those heightened loads. We actually check it has enough capacity, enough strength to resist them. Accidental limit states, however, aren't always looked into. And, and accidental limit states could be earthquake. Fire, however, is also an accidental limit state. And, and because it's an accident, because you don't expect it to happen a day in, day out, this is based on lower load factors with the ultimate limit state. And this is important for a number of reasons. And the reason for this is that in a fire, if the accidental limit state conditions, if your member or your steel element was at 100% of its capacity for the ultimate limit state, it would only be, be around 60 to 50% of its capacity in the fire limit state or the accidental limit state based on that load factor. Um, and this is going to be very, very important when we get onto this concept of temperature that we default to. So I hope that's given you a, a good understanding of the terminologies of limit state and utilization. Um, now we'll really get into, now we've got armed with all of that understanding, um, let's look at where these default limiting temperatures have come from. And I've, I've picked a few design codes. Um, We'll be looking at BS5950, the American codes of the SEE, um, and also the Euro codes. Um, and I will also then be looking at the Australian codes once we've gone through these codes. But these are the temperatures that we typically adopt throughout the industry. So it's a really good starting point. Um, we have beams supporting concrete slabs. We have temperatures sort of 620 for beams three-sided. And this, is, this number has been used for years and is used throughout our industry, although it comes from BS5950. It might not actually be relevant to the design code within that country. <clears throat> the American codes 593 for beams. For four-sided beams, BS5950 is 555, and the American codes 593, and columns. This has been rationalized to 550 for BS5950 design, but if you read the code, it's actually 540 or 510, depending on the slenderness. And for the American codes, it's 538. Europe, Euro codes are slightly different because these are usually based on the national annexes that they have. So this is usually quite country specific, but range typically from 500 to 550. Um, so there doesn't seem to be very good agreement between any of these temperatures. So where are these differences coming from? And we're going to try to explain most of these temperatures in the coming slides. But uh, this is just to give you an appreciation of a the structural element types and the temperatures used based on those design codes. So first of all, what are the differences? Where, where, where are these differences coming from? And, and first, I want to show you the reduction in steel properties, the differences that the codes have here. Um, one of the first slides I showed you was the reduction of steel to the yield strength to the euro codes. And how steel loses strength at elevated temperatures. Um, what you're looking at here is the strength reductions um, for the American codes. Um, and you will notice the blue line, so left axis again, strength, bottom axis, steel temperature. So the blue line is the yield strength, um, and that's what we saw before. And this, this really is governing bending behavior. Um, if the beam bending, that's really what it's sort of governing it, its failure mode. The other line, however, the linear elastic range, this is the Young's modulus. This is a reduction in Young's modulus as a material property. And this is really governing stiffness or buckling behavior. So it's more akin to column profiles or compression elements. So this is what the American codes have. And the Euro codes are nearly identical. They have a good agreement with this idea that steel properties lose um, lose at, at elevated temperatures. The only addition that the Euro codes add is they acknowledge that this concrete slab on the top flange of the three-sided beam would have some beneficial heat sink effect. So this third line you're now seeing at the far right, this is governing um, bending for beams with a slab on top, both non-composite and composite. What about BS5950? Again, really good agreement. Um, yield strength, um, it's, it's the same. It has this concept that a concrete slab on the top flange would, would have a beneficial heat sink effect. And the only difference here is they, they, they have a relaxation for columns and um, based on the slenderness. So, so a slight relaxation on the temperatures there. But again, really good agreement with properties. So where, where are the other differences coming from then in these temperatures? Well, 
But let's now have a look at what the um, factors are for the ultimate limit state. As remember, that was for the strength of the steel and the accidental limit state, so fire. Um, and what you're seeing here is um, the factors for the ultimate limit state, 1.4, 1.6. So for your dead load, live load, or permanent or variable actions. And you'll see that for fire, there's a, there's a really good reduction that you need for the actual loading condition. So from 1.4, you go to 1 for dead. For variable 1.6, you go to 0 0.8 for live. So there is, a, there is a, a significant reduction in the factors used for the fire limit state. So let's now look at what we would do if I was an engineer. Well, I estimate my loading conditions, the variable of the permanent actions, and I would check for that serviceability requirements. You remember the vibration, cracking, deflection, things like that. I would check that the beam can deal with that. I would then factor these loads up for the ultimate limit state and check the beam has enough strength. But in fire, I'm going to use those reduced loading factors. And as you can see, the load you expect in fire from what you expected ultimate limit state is much reduced. That is why the utilization and ambient conditions will always be lower in the fire conditions. You relax the, um, the, the load factors that you need to use. Now, BS5950, those default values that are used, that's 620, 550, or 540, 510, um, assume, again, that the beams or columns or the elements are 100% utilized, and there is a split of permanent and variable actions of 50-50, or one-to-one, -one, that is an even split. So what does that actually mean? Well, simply, we go back to those reduction um, in properties that we saw earlier. And as I mentioned before, we have columns, beams, and beams free-sided with that concrete slab on top. I might mention that the one you're seeing here for the beams free-sided, that is for non-composite only. But that 50-50 split, 100%, would relate to 60% utilization of the accidental limit state. And if we look at the temperatures, you see that it's 540, 510 for the columns, 550 for four-sided beams, and 620 for free-sided beams. And this is where those values have come from. And these are used throughout the industry, as I mentioned before, and they've been around for a long, long time. So we understand where those temperatures have come from. What about the American codes? Well, again, a lot of similarities. We have factors for the ultimate limit state and factors for the accidental limit state. And you can see they also agree there is a reduction in the loading condition in fire from the ultimate limit state. Now, what the, what the American codes did was instead of looking at a 50-50 split or, or looking at any, any sort of load ratio, what they did was they went, let's just assume that in fire, everything will be at 50% accidental limit state utilization. So if we then go to their reductions in properties, which are again, very similar, we'll see that actually for 100% utilization, they've related that to 50%. And that will relate to 538 degrees C for the columns and 593 for both three-sided and four-sided beams. Again, they don't recognize that there's any beneficial heat sink effect. So we can see that it's followed a very, very similar principle to BS5950 as, as well as the American codes. And what, what about the Euro codes? We noticed there was, a, there was a little bit of difference there that it seemed to be single temperatures. But again, reading the codes, you will find that there is good agreement that the load factors we use for the ultimate limit state are reduced for fire. Again, very, very similar. And we would do the same again. We would check for serviceability requirements, factor up the loads for ultimate limit state, and then reduce those for the fire limit state. And if just for a second, we assume that the accidental limit state is 60% utilization, again, what would we get in terms of temperature? Well, it's the same process again. We would get 500 for columns, 550 for beams four-sided, and 580 for beams three-sided, both composite and non-composite. But again, the, the principles in these three design codes, when you really look at it, are identical in how you would derive temperature. 
And I might hasten to add that these temperatures you're seeing now are actually going to be the new, new default temperatures that will be adopted in the Yellow Book 6th edition. Hempel have been helping create that um, document with a number of other manufacturers as well, but these are the new temperatures that will be coming out when that is released. Um, and now if you really look at the temperatures, understanding where they've, they've come from, you actually start seeing that they're actually very similar. Um, so for the beams free side is 625, 93, 580. There isn't much difference between those temperatures. For columns, 540, 538, 500, there's, there's quite good, actually, there's actually quite good agreement between where the temperatures came from. Yes, there are subtle differences within the codes, but you can now see that these temperatures are all quite similar. And where they have been derived from comes from pretty much the same kind of principles. Now, what about Australia? Well, Australia typically adopts 620 for beams free-sided and 550 for column profiles. Now, the Australian codes um, also have factors for the ultimate limit state and also have factors for the accidental limit state, the fire. Um, and what you're seeing now is for an office building, this is what, what is it within the Australian codes. And again, you see that there is that trend. There is that trend that the loads at ultimate limit state are relaxed for fire. However, the reduction in strength in the Australian codes are quite a bit different than the other three codes we've been through. I'm, I'm showing you now the reduction in yield strength and Young's modulus um, to the left. And if I actually plot um, the yield strength reduction, which is where the temperature calculation should come from in the Australian codes, you can see that there's agreement that the properties reduce at elevated temperatures. But you will notice that they are different, whereas we saw BS5950, Euro codes, and the Australian codes all have very similar properties. The Australian codes are slightly different in that regard. Agreement that they reduce, but very much a straight line, and they cross, cross through a lot of these properties. But it is going to be a very, very similar process to calculate temperatures. And I've actually done this. I realize that 625.50 are used, but if you actually look at the Australian codes, what would the temperatures be if we, well, assume 60% utilization at the fire case, 50% utilization in the fire case. And then finally, and I must put a warning on this, what if we use some of the methodologies from the Euro code and actually accounted for that beneficial heat sink effect of the free sided beam? Well, at 60% ALS utilization, you would get a temperature of 500 degrees across the board for all profiles. And this might actually be a more suitable default limiting temperature for the Australian market. If we look at 50%, you'll actually get 560 degrees for the accidental limit state, which is more close to that 550 we saw before. Um, and if, if we now account for this heat sink effect that we would get based on Euro code methodologies. This is not written in the, um, the Australian code, so please take this with a pinch of salt. This is just if we were to use that sort of methodology here and account for that beneficial heat sink effect, you'd actually get a temperature for 60% of 553 degrees C and 612 degrees for beams free-sided. Um, and what's really interesting here um, is at 50% ALS utilization, uh, which, which is a, a very reasonable utilization for fire limit state. 560 and 612 are very close to the 550, 620 that have been used. However, I really do believe that there is actually some work that could be done to actually create default temperatures for the Australian um, market based on the Australian codes as well. So I just wanted to share that with you. So same principles again would be used um, and they can be derived um, in this way. Apart from the three-sided beam data, that was just to, to show you what it could look like. Um, but as I say, 560, 612 is very close to what we have seen was suggested in the BS5950 approaches. So I hope that's given you a really good appreciation of where the default temperatures have come from and how we calculate those. But now more importantly, I think this now leads on to, well, what do you do when you actually calculate them from first principles, these design temperatures? And What's important to note is codes such as BS5950, Part 8, Euro codes, and the Australian codes actually allow designers to exploit structural steel properties better than just using these defaults. And we can actually calculate and optimize the fire protection requirement 
um, by looking at the, the level of utilization within the steel structure, the end use occupancy types, and actually balance a lot of factors to actually calculate these temperatures rather than using the defaults we've mentioned before. Um, and I, I want to go back to my, my first image and again, the, the reductions you're looking at here are actually for, for the Euro codes. But again, we've seen that all the other codes would follow similar methodologies. <clears throat> and at the minute, when we don't know anything about a structure, without doing any structural fire design assessment, we default to those um, limiting temperatures that we've mentioned before. So in this case, 550. But if we knew that the utilization was maybe 80% at ambient conditions for the ULS, that would also have a knock-on effect that the ultimate limits of the accidental limit state utilization would be lower also. And what that means is because there's more capacity, the temperature could be increased. The design temperature would be higher. And as the utilization at ambient conditions goes down, so does the utilization in fire and the temperature increases. Um, what this means is the lower the level of utilization, the higher the design temperature. Because there is more capacity left within the steel, we are enabling it, we can allow it to get a bit hotter than say a profile at 100% utilization. So we don't have to insulate it as much, but still provide the level of protection and stability required within that structure. Um, but why is this important? Why should, we, why should we care or want to actually calculate these? Well, again, if that 100% is where the default limiting temperatures come from, and we do no structural fire design assessment at all, we might be in a thickness of say two millimeters, just for an example. But as utilization decreases, we have seen that the temperature well, increases. And with an increase in temperature, the DFT or the thickness of intrumescent would decrease. And you can see quite significant savings in terms of thickness requirements. So maybe at say 80%, you'd have a volume saving or DFT reduction of 14%. Maybe the lighter tertiary elements might be at 40 or 20 percent. There might be a 30, 40 percent reduction in thickness requirement on those elements as soon as you start looking at this concept of utilization. So the lower the level of utilization, the higher the design temperature, the lower the thickness requirement of intumescent. Um, but don't engineers design to 100 percent utilization for their structures? Well, typically we don't. Um, some beams, we, or some columns, we definitely do design to 100% of their capacity, but serviceability requirements often drive the utilizations in, in a lot of our profiles. So we're usually quite limited. Also, we rationalize designs quite often. So we might design one beam to be worst case, but then the rest aren't utilized that much. And many profiles are actually only there for when we're actually constructing the building. Once in service, they're at very low levels of utilization. And what I'm showing you here is sort of an example of the typical utilization throughout a structure. And what, what is really telling is that most of the structure is below 80% utilization at ambient conditions. And most tertiary elements are never stressed above 50% of their ambient capacity. This was an assessment done by um, the third party of BS, BCSA, um, analyzing 30 buildings, looking at levels of utilization. So there's definitely potential to optimize structures if we start looking at utilizations, which are typically not done. And there's clearly benefits um, to carrying out this kind of assessment. Uh, I mean, a, a clear advantage is that the volume reductions would be much lower. So, so there's definitely a reduction in volume, but also a knock-on effect is if we reduce the thickness of intumescent, we can actually increase productivity lower um, application costs because we don't have to apply as many coats of intumescent, remedials will be reduced and touch up some site um, reduced also. So it really speed up construction sequences by actually carrying out this kind of assessment. And finally, um, and, and one, one that's really important um, is the sustainability benefits. Um, I, I hear that we really need to start, as engineers, we really need to start looking at the embodied carbon um, within all the structures that we design. And, and I've seen there's been a lot of talk about we need to really get the steel sizes as optimized as possible, as thin as we possibly can. But that will have a knock-on effect that the intrumescent or the fire protection requirements will increase. Um, and I actually worry that by trying to reduce the steel sizes, we're actually going to have a knock-on effect by actually increasing um, the, the, the embodied carbon, by actually increasing the fire protection requirements. And, and I, 
I would really like to see that instead of doing that, maybe we can keep designs the same, but actually start looking at reducing the fire protection requirement by actually starting to do these structural fire design assessments and looking at steel holistically with fire protection and steel combined. Um, that's just a thought. Um, but really, what I hope we've really discussed today is that concept of default limiting temperatures and design temperatures and the difference between them. But it, I must make it very clear that, that to cal cal calculate temperatures, this must be done by a suitably qualified engineer. Um, and to carry out these calculations is usually beyond um, the capacity of most of those that are applying or specifying intumescence. So this has to be done by engineers and has to be done in collaboration. And, and really, I think that's why Hempel have put so much emphasis on our support structure in terms of engineers, estimators, and product managers, and focus commercial teams. So we can actually collaborate with engineers to carry out these assessments. We have structural and fire engineers as part of our teams to actually collaborate with engineers on their projects to actually carry out these fire design assessments. And it's my hope that we actually do that and that we get to speak to you all a little bit more going forwards. And I, I really think but we need to start thinking about how we can collaborate as engineers and actual manufacturers and thinking of steel holistically, steel and fire protection, all as one, so that we don't consider fire protection as an afterthought once we're actually at site. Um, but I would just like to thank everybody for your time um, today, and I hope, hope you found this presentation um, interesting and look forward to the Q&A session afterwards. Thank you. A huge thank you to Blair Stratton and David Barron for this afternoon's presentations. Uh, Blair and David are now here, well, are here to take questions from you. It's your turn to get involved. And we have about 50 minutes of Q&A. So if you'd like to submit a question, please do so via the chat box. Um, if you'd like to provide your name and who the question for, that would be great. And we did receive some questions on registration. So thank you to those people and we'll start with um, the first one for you David uh, from Hassan in Queensland. Good afternoon Hassan. Asking will the proper selection of high strength fasteners, bolts and nuts help in keeping the steel frame in its place? Thanks David. Thanks Amanda. Um, and yes uh, it's it's a good question and I, I think if, if I can answer it from the perspective of say, say fire protection um, so we have bolts, we have connections, and we need to ensure that these can actually uh, maintain their stability as well. Um, so whatever bolts, whatever fixings you have, we need to ensure that that has the correct level of fire protection. And best practice that we have today, um, what we would recommend is that you apply the same thickness as the primary element. Um, so in these connection interfaces, you tend to find there's a lot more steel in these areas. So you expect them to be slightly cooler than the rest of the profile. So best practice is to apply the same thickness as that primary element. Um, but I might take that a little bit further. If you've got something framing into a primary element that isn't protected, then you might also need to apply a coat back um, just to stop any unwanted heat transfer into that um, profile. Um, and we are doing work um, within the industry to see if we can actually reduce or omit um, coat backs as well. And um, if there's not much heat transfer, um, into the actual primary element, it might be possible to emit any need for a coat back. Um, but again, this needs to be done looking at heat transfer um, and really done in collaboration with manufacturers, with any test data or modeling. And, and again, I think we'd be happy to discuss if you have any details you'd like to discuss on a project. Um, but simply put, we would recommend applying the same thickness as the primary element. Thanks for that, David. And Blair, over to you. We've talked a lot about codes and standards this afternoon. So maybe just to just circle back to the uh, AMRA in Queensland uh, is asking you, are these codes and standards applicable to Australia and New Zealand? Thanks, AMRA. Um, I think David was fairly clear in his presentation uh, where his data and which standards were applicable. Um, I, I, my presentation was only focused on the building code of Australia um, and the only standard I mentioned was AS 4100, the steel standard. Uh, it's important to understand not just the standard that's referenced in the building code for the element or material that you're trying to design, but also the year of the standard, which amendments of the standards that were applied. Um, 
coming from New Zealand, some of you may have picked my accent. Um, I've worked there for a few years. I'm a chartered professional engineer in New Zealand as well as Australia. And um, the New Zealand building code, again, is very explicit about which standards it has adopted um, based on government um, research and decisions. That, you know, these standards are the ones that we need to classify fire spread rates or combustibility, et cetera. Um, so again, go, go to the source, go to the Building Code of Australia or the New Zealand Building Code uh, Acceptable Solutions Handbook as a starting point. If you want to vary from those standards, talk to a fire safety engineer if it's a fire safety problem or talk to a structural engineer if it's a structural problem, et cetera, and, and determine with your building surveyor or with the council in New Zealand uh, what, what your pathway is to demonstrate that an alternative standard meets the performance requirements of the code. Um, it's finally, New Zealand, uh, like Australia, has a performance-based building code. So if you can prove that something is safer than the prescriptive um, method or meets the performance requirements standing on its own two feet, then that is an acceptable method of compliance. Thanks, Blair. Thank you. Um, we've had a great question that's come in from Sabira, who is watching from New South Wales. Um, David, we might kick off with you and then, Blair, you might want to jump in. Uh, but Sabir is asking, how does one ensure that in case of a fire in buildings, the temperature does not exceed the limits you mentioned? Thanks, David. Yeah, no, I, I can I can start with that one. Thank you. And and yes, it's all it's all about ensuring that we get the right thicknesses of intumescent or whatever passive fire protection material on those structures. And um, so we need to understand obviously the fire duration the limiting temperatures and ensure that from all the testing we do on the relevant standards, we get the correct thickness on, on the steel profiles. Um, but it's OK us testing these products as getting thicknesses that we, you know, we specify. But we also need to ensure they're actually applied correctly. And, and this is sometimes where it all falls down. We need to ensure that the quality of application or installation actually meets requirements. And, and then following that, we need to ensure they're actually maintained as well. Um, so, so there's lots of good guidance out there for ensuring the right um, thicknesses are applied, say, for intumescence or other materials. But we need to make sure that from, you know, testing all the way through to application and maintenance is 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 um, sort of followed as well. So I don't think it just stops with the manufacturers. I think it's the whole supply chain application. We need to look at it um, through the whole process and um, right to the um, cradle to grave of the structure as well. Um, but that, that takes us all ensuring that we do our part. Thanks, David. Do you want to comment on that, Blair, as well? Yeah, um, from a, I guess, more fundamental aspect, um, if you have a system such as a sprinkler system, you may find that when that system operates, you never get um, flash over, you don't get an upper layer that's anywhere close to 600 degrees. That's if the sprinkler's operator is designed. Now, we've got about 150 years of data on that for Australia and New Zealand. Um, the um, work that was done in the late 80s by Harry Marriott demonstrated that sprinkler systems in Australia and New Zealand had a 99.95% effectiveness uh, or, or reliability, sorry, uh, it was reliability. But um, more recently, uh, more detailed studies have shown us with single or dual water supplies, you can have really efficient, uh, really effective sprinkler systems. And if you have a sprinkler system, then you take care of most of the problem. Of course, what happens if the system fails? Well, then you need to consider how critical is your asset? How critical is that piece of structure? If it's a, um, you know, an underground rail station, I would argue very critical, very sensitive to these rare events such as a sprinkler failure during a, during a large fire. But the consequences is absolutely massive. Um, so, so it pays to take a holistic view and maybe take a step back to say, well, what problem are we trying to solve? Is it a problem about temperature and steel? Or is it an overall fire safety problem? And when you take that step back, you can actually start to frame the problem in different ways. Look at all of the available systems, the ventilation, where the people are, what the fire brigade's response is. Um, do we have statistics for all of those things? And then, of course, designing a uh, structural protection system to deal with the cases that are critical to your outcomes. Thanks. Thank you, Blair uh, and David. And we've had a great question, uh, a bit of a statement. Um, so I think it's something to talk to, uh, to Blair. And it's coming from Albert. Good afternoon, Albert, who's in New South Wales, asking, the risk of high-rise building fires are remote. I'd like to concentrate on using our experience in high temperature effects 
on metal structures in steel, and especially in aluminium in, in space structures, subject to severe changes in temperature when exposed to the sun on the light side, dark side. Uh, Blair. Um, so I'm, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I don't spend a lot of time looking at energy efficiency, but I think the last part of your question was probably about you know, window frames heating up and distorting in, in uh, cyclical uh, ranges of temperatures. That's, um, I guess that's, you know, that's a question for NASA. Those, those are you know, space age questions about uh, will the window frame fall out after 30 years of cycling. Um, what, what I'm more interested in as a fire engineer is really understanding risk and what that means. You mentioned that the risk of high-rise fires is low. Well, I would argue the complete opposite. We saw the tragedy in Greenfell um, that a, a single high-rise fire killed uh, over, over 70 people in a single event. That, that is clearly an unacceptable consequence, um, and that's triggered massive government investigations around the world um, and, and massive bills to owners to fix non-compliant structures. Um, in some cases, those owners can go back to the original um, builders and, and, and wrongdoers and sue them, but in a lot of cases, they've got to flip, flip the bill themselves. And these are societally unacceptable problems. So the risk is high. It's unacceptable. I think what you're talking about is the frequency is low, but when you have a very low frequency, extremely high consequence event, like a Grenfell type tower fire, you really need to consider the consequences of that extreme event. So when I, when I talked about my retail shop fire, I wouldn't be comfortable assigning a one in 40 million probability of collapse if that was say a high rise apartment fire above it. Because even though it's such a vanishingly small consequence, if we design 40 million of these buildings around the world, one of them will collapse and it would kill far too many people to avoid being you know, royal commission level of inquiries and, and huge outrage at the engineering profession for allowing such a thing to happen. So we have to be very careful as engineers, first of all, to understand risk, and secondly, to apply risk carefully, not just avoiding low probability, high consequence events because of the low probability and where they sit in a risk matrix, but actually taking a so far as reasonably practicable approach to mitigating the risk. Thanks, Blair. And just staying with you uh, for now, we've had a question that's coming from Lucas. Uh, good afternoon, asking if a system, i.e. 60, or it slash does not last at least 16 minutes in actual fire. Um, what does it mean? Blair. Sorry, that was bound to happen. Um, just because you've bought a Dash 6030 door from a door manufacturer, that means that they have tested it under standard conditions to that uh, ISO 834 fire curve. You know the the logarithmically in, in increasing time temperature curve that I showed after the picture of the, the test furnace. Um, so that, that lasted for 60 minutes without failing because of the toe poking through the sock, because the flame didn't pass through the middle of the, the door uh, or it didn't go around the, around the door jam. Um, it also means that for 30 minutes, the door didn't heat up on the unexposed side. But when you, you put that into a real fire, Again, if you have sprinklers, the sprinklers hopefully will do their job, so the door will not fail at all. Um, and I'm using an analogy of a door because you've all seen fire doors, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, if you have a low intensity because you have um, not much ventilation, then that fire could burn for a very long time. And um, if you're familiar with your backyard barbecue, you know the low and slow, um, how, how, do you, how do you burn a log for overnight and get heat out of it all night, you turn the ventilation down on your wood fire heater. Um, so just by changing the ventilation conditions, by having more windows that can break during a fire or more doors or more mechanical ventilation systems, you can actually change how fast the, the fire hits a peak temperature, how long it stays there, and by changing the fuel load, you'll change the duration of the fire overall. All of these factors combine to uh, tell a fire engineer what the intensity and duration of the actual fire is, and we can use that to try and estimate the conditions, uh, the, the impact on the structure. But that's a very different set of calculations. In fact, it is a calculation as opposed to a test. It gives us confidence in the time that a member will take to fail during a real fire, but that's very different than the rated performance of your fire door or your 60 dash dash protected steel. Um, that, that, you know, potentially is another hour's topic uh, and hopefully I haven't confused anyone from my explanation, but uh, hopefully that helps. Thanks, Blair. 
Thanks, Blair. Yes, I think it, yeah, it's another another webinar on its way. Um, David, I'd like to, so we, unfortunately, we've run out of time, and I'd like to make this our last question, David, that we've been asked by Egbert is asking if the comp uh, compartment upon investigation were found never exceeds 500 Celsius, can we assume a 60 steel column is unlikely to fail? Thank you, David. Yep, no, and it's a, a tricky one to end on, so I'll, I, I will try to answer it. And I think this actually comes back to what Blair had just been speaking about as well. Where we test our products to this fire resistance curve. But the actual fire that the steel profiles will see really depends on the fuel load, the ventilation conditions. Um, so if you can show that the fire will never actually exceed 500 degrees in any case, then the steel would never actually reach 500 degrees. And if that is below its limiting temperature, that steel profile would never fail. It would never be able to get hot enough to reach its limiting temperature. So in effect, no protection would be needed. However, I think we rarely find fires that actually only reach 500 degrees. I think even when we look at traveling fires and other, other real fires, we tend to find they get quite hot at their peak, even if it is only for a short time. And, and if you've got unprotected steel, then they will exceed that. But in principle, yes, if, this, if the fire never exceeds the limiting temperature of the steel, then no protection would be needed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it is all we have time for today. So please join me once again in thanking Blair Stratton and David Barron for their time and insights shared at today's session. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Hempel, for making our webinar possible. As always, we're looking for your feedback on today's session. It helps us improve and plan for future sessions. So if you could take a couple of minutes and please complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our next Thought Leaders webinar. Good evening. <laughs>